completely down. Hey, boy. I know. I see you. <laughs> hey. I know. All right. Good evening, everybody. It's good to be here tonight. Thank you all for being here. Uh, we'll go ahead and get started. I appreciate all of you uh, for coming. And I hope and pray that the Lord will help you. Some with a study tonight. I'm going to be over in the 22nd chapter of Genesis. And we've been bouncing around a little bit because of the way I did things a few Sundays ago. But uh, we'll get back on track now. Start making some headway through the rest of the book. I've determined not to, not to preach every little jot and tittle uh, like I started to do. Uh, namely because I wanted to kind of get through. And I want to spend a little more time talking about some other things uh, that are relevant uh, in the text when we get to them. Uh, plus, some of that is, I'll be honest with you, uh, it, I hate to say the word boring. It's not boring. It's just, it becomes monotonous. Uh, a lot of these things are going to say the same things over and over and over again. It's repeating uh, promises, repeating commands, repeating just teaching points, and I kind of want to get to some other stuff that's a little more interesting and in hopes that it'll spark your interest to go do uh, some more independent study on your own. Before we start, Don, anybody have a spoken prayer request? My cousin, my little cousin Dana, I asked prayer for the other day. She's not doing well. Called the family in this evening, so be, be much in prayer for them. Uh, the Lord can still do a miracle. God's still got time uh, to do what he needs to do. So you pray for pray for her, pray for their, her family, her children, and her husband, uh, especially. That's absolutely right. Anybody else?
estoura bem aqui. Matter of fact, Chris, Chris told me earlier he'd rather hear you than hear me on Wednesday. So that, that's pretty well what you said. Yeah, I told her she can't be, you know, bleeding over into my time anymore. <laughs> you know, that's all right. Yeah. Listen, I, I, I got a, I don't do TikTok very much. Every once in a while, I'll get a notification to look on there. Another day, I had one from Edgar Poe Cat. And I said, who in the world is Edgar Poe Cat? And then I seen it was a skunk. And I knew exactly who Edgar Poe Cat was. The only skunk in America with its own TikTok. I did not. I know. Blasphemy, I know. Listen, the only way I'm going to rent my clothes, though, is if he sprays me. I'm on Dan, I will. I'll watch his videos. A sniffer? What? Jeez. Y'all remember the Tiger King? Yeah, that's what we're going to call her. All right. Anybody else have a? <laughs> I don't. He, Amen. Yeah, no, Miss Cora. Any others? All right. All unspoken requests, let it be known, but lift your hand. Uh, all it will, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you for the day. Thank you for the opportunity to be here tonight. Thank you for the chance to bow in worthy heads and call on your precious name again. Lord, I thank you for each and every one that's gathered this way tonight. I pray you touch and bless each one of us in a mighty and a special and a powerful way. Do the work that needs to be done. We'll be careful to thank you and praise you. Give you the honor and glory for it all. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Uh, Genesis chapter number 22. If you got your Bibles, I'm going to read all the way down through verse number 24, so that'll be the whole chapter, and uh, again, there's a lot to read, but there's a lot to gather, uh, I'm going to, tonight we'll have, uh, next Wednesday night we're not going to have uh, church next Wednesday night, and then we'll meet back the following Wednesday night and pick back up after that, so tonight I'm doing the first part of this, uh, which would be what I call testing. Just a, just a little two-part message on the testing of God. And this first part here, there's four lessons that I got out of it that the Lord really speaks, well, that we can really, that the Lord really speaks to my heart. There's four different types of lessons to be learned just from this chapter alone. And uh, there's way much more that you can mine out, and there's a whole lot of, there's a whole lot of things to see and to dig out of here. Uh, but it's very important that we get through these next few chapters. Uh, when we get to the end of chapter 24, there's something real special happens in there. And I'm, and I'm really excited about getting that far. I don't know how long it'll take me to get there. But this chapter 23 and 24 are really special chapters in the book of Genesis. And I'm, I'm excited about it. So let's read. And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here am I, or here I am. And he said, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains which I will tell thee of. And Abraham rose up early in the morning and saddled his ass and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son and clave the wood for the burnt offering and rose up and went unto the place of which God had told him. Then on the third day Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. 
And Abraham said unto his young men, Abide ye here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again to you. And Abraham took the, word, the wood of the burnt offering and laid it upon Isaac his son, and he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and they went both of them together. And Isaac spoke unto Abraham his father and said, My father, and he said, Here am I, uh, my son. And he said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went both of them together. And they came to the place which God had told him of, and Abraham built an altar there, altar there and laid the wood in order, and bound Isaac his son, and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. And the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham, and he said, Here am I. And he said, Lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in the thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. And Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah Jireh. As it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord it shall be seen. And the angel of the Lord called unto Abraham out of heaven the second time and said, By myself have I sworn, saith the Lord, for because thou hast done this thing, and hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, that in blessing will I bless thee, and in multiplying will I multiply thy seed as the stars of the heaven, and as the sand which is upon the seashore, and thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies." And in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because thou hast obeyed my voice. So Abraham returned unto his young men, and they rose up and went together to Beersheba. And Abraham dwelled at Beersheba. And it came to pass after these things that it was told Abraham, saying, Behold, uh, Milcah, she has also born children unto thy brother Nahor, uh, who is his firstborn, and, and Buz his brother, and Kimuel the father of Aram. And Jesed, and Hazo, and Pildash, and, and Jidlaf, and Bethuel. And Bethuel begat Rebekah. These eight Milcah did bear to Nahor, Abraham's brother. And his concubine, whose name was R Ruma, she bare also Teba, and Gaham, and Tahash, and Maka. Uh, a lot of things have happened since we left off, as you can see obviously, uh, from where we kind of jumped back and forth a little bit. When we left off last week, we were a few chapters behind. So Isaac has been born. Uh, and we know that God had made Abraham the promise that Isaac would be born, that he would have a son by Sarah, and he, he did. So Isaac is, uh, he's, he's, grown, he's grown up enough to know at this particular time exactly what's going on. Isaac is aware of the sacrifice, which leads us to believe that he was at least, most likely, at least 12 years old. Uh, I would submit to you that he's probably somewhere, because in the Old Testament, they considered young men lads up until the time that they were in their mid-30s. Uh, obviously, they lived a lot longer back then. So, you know, if you think about things in terms of how they would consider somebody, they would be considered uh, to be up into their 30s. It is possible. I'm not saying it is a fact, but it is possible because there's so much typology uh, in this story. Uh, it, it's very feasible to me that Isaac was probably in his early 30s, and he could be 33 and a half at the time that this actually takes place so uh it's you know as, as you can see a type of the sun being 33 and a half years old it is it's very possible i'm not saying it is but i'm just but i'm not going to add to or take away because we're not told for certain but it is very possible that he could be 33 years old at the moment this and he'd still be referred to as a lad uh, in the old testament uh even over into the new testament in John chapter number 6, where the, the young lad comes, uh, we're not told exactly how old he is. Uh, you know, so lads would still be referred to as, as young men. 
Uh, so it could have been, he could have been a boy. He could have been a teenager. But uh, generally, lads were young males above the age of 12 uh, on into their 30s. So that lasted for quite a while. Uh, but the reason that this is a test, and I'm going to start out kind of slow. I want you all to stay with me because I'm going to get somewhere with you, if you will. The reason that I call it a test is because in, embedded in this story is a test that comes from Satan himself. And the reason that I say it comes from Satan himself is it's not that Satan actually appears in bodily form or in picture. Satan appears in the mind of Abraham. And Satan appears in the mind of Isaac uh, in the form of what are you going to do faced with the ultimate decision? Many of us in this room, all of us in this room, would be willing to sacrifice ourselves for a few people. We would give our life for a few people. Some of us would give our lives for a multitude of people. But none of us in this room would lay down our lives for everybody. Well, we love to say that we would. But the reality is, none of us are willing to die for everybody. And that's just human nature. Self-preservation kicks in. We have a certain amount of love for our family, our children, our spouses, our siblings, our parents. You know, those, We would be willing to die for people we know. Uh, I would love to believe that those of you that have children and grandchildren in here, that I would, I would sacrifice my life for any of your children because I know them. I would like to believe that I would sacrifice my life for any child that was in danger, that I'd put myself in, 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 at risk to try to, to save their life. I would love to believe that I, uh, I've never been faced with that, but I would love, I, I believe that I would. I think I would, but I don't know for sure. But I would say this. What you see come up in this is something that it's kind of test that only comes from Satan himself. And the reason that I say it comes from Satan because it brings out the worst in us or it'll bring out the best in you. You only have two reactions when Satan comes to buffet. And it'll either make you better or it'll make you bitter. One of the two. Uh, so anytime you go through something, and it's the same here in this story, there's a choice to be made. Uh, Warren Wiersbe said this. He said, the most severe tests do not come from people, but they come from the Lord. Yet the greatest blessings accompany the greatest tests. I thought that was, it was pretty, it was pretty, you know, which he, he way out thinks me. And he said that God tested Lot in this, much in the same way. Lot lived in such a, on such a low level that Sodom, that Sodom and the world tested him. And it is the saint that walks closest to the Lord that God tests the greatest. And I thought that was great coming from somebody, a biblical scholar like that, as it put a lot of things in perspective for me that, you know, when you're when you're not walking with Christ, when you're not really trying to live for the Lord, you, you're going. You're not. Uh, you're not. Uh, I can't think of the word that I'm trying to think of. You're not immune to testing. You're going to be tested, but you're going to be tested differently. But when you're trying to live for God, the kind of tests that you go through to, are on a whole new level. And this is something that I, you know. Uh, I, I, I'm, I mean, I currently deal with a lot of people who have issues. I know people think, you know, because I don't have a degree or anything in counseling, uh, that I'm not a counselor, but I, I promise you, I probably hear more counseling than people who get paid to sit and listen to it all day. I might need to just set up an office out here and put a couch out there and just let people come and talk. Uh, you know, I don't know, Craig, I'm not. <laughs> hey, hey, hey. But here's, here's something that I have, and, and I'm not trying to throw shade on anybody or talk negative. Uh, some of you in here have experienced this. 
but I'm learning more about it every time I have to deal with it. One of the things that I'm dealing with more often these days than I ever have before are, are recovering addicts. And, I'm, and, I, and it really and truly it started, you know, back when we started this work and all those inmates were coming here. I mean, they all had issues and they, a lot of them were in jail for small things, but almost all of it was drugs. I mean, almost all of it. I think we had one guy that was in here for failure to pay child support. And I probably had more compassion on the addicts than I did him, just to be honest with you. But, uh, it, it, you know, I guess it is what it is. But in talking to those, those guys, I started to develop a, a level of compassion for them, uh, all in the, main, in the same time keeping in mind that they were probably trying to play me to get their way. And, but when you hear their stories and you listen to them talk and you, and you get to know them, sometimes you have those conversations where they're trying to just, you know, distract you, make you feel sorry for them, things like that. You know, I mean, it just, that's how it goes. Uh, but then there are those moments where they really open up and they expect nothing in return. They're just, they're just opening up being honest about their struggles. I always find that the greatest struggle with those guys were when they would get here. Uh, and I always use Robbie. You know, you remember Robbie was here. Robbie came, and Robbie was here for, not you, Robbie, but it's another Robbie. Uh, he was probably in jail at some point in time in your life. But anyway, uh, should have been. Uh, but when Robbie came, Robbie was here with us for three, four weeks. Uh, he came, and he, he worked, and he, you know, he'd do his thing, and he wouldn't talk. And we'd get in here, and, and you know, I'd, I'd always spend a couple of, two or three different points of the day, we'd stop working, and I'd take them out and just sit them down, and we'd sit in the gravels, and or just in the shade, or in there, we'd come in here, at that time we just had this little fourth of a sanctuary, and we'd just sit and we'd talk, I, and I'd uh, do devotionals with them, I'd preach to them, and just give them the gospel, and you know, I wanted them to hear as much of it as they could while they were here, and not just be about work. Uh, but Robbie was over and over and over again. I mean, he would listen, and he'd always be respectful, but he would never talk. And one day, we were, we were talking, and every, we were out in the coffee shop working, and, you know, he, he, I'll never forget, he looked at me, and he said, I, I've got to get away from you. Just move out of the way. I've got to get away from you. So I, you know, obviously, what did I do? I stepped right in his way. I'm not, I'm not going to let him out at this point. And I, and I see his eyes, and, you know, they're, they're, they're welling up. And, I, and he said, do you, do you know what I'm in jail for? No. And I didn't. And I honestly tell you that I didn't. I never went and asked any of them. They would tell me most of the time. But Robbie never told me till this night. And he said, you know, I did. I, I, you know, I, I used and I, I've been in jail for various things, but this time I'm in jail for, for I think it was stealing, uh, armed robbery or something like that. I don't remember exactly how it was. He laid it out to me, but, and he just broke. Me and him standing there by ourselves, and the dude just broke. And, you know, he's just, his body language, he just, and he just fell. He just fell right into me. I'll never forget hugging the guy, and we came in in the church and we prayed, and I mean he, and from then on, he was a different guy. But he would always after that we'd have conversation too, and he would always say, you know, till I started trying to do right, I never knew what hard, how hard it really was. I had the same conversation with a fella not too long ago that lives not too far from here, he called me and he said, you know, since I've been clean, all, I'm stressed out all the time. And it occurred to me one day while we were talking, I said, you know why that is? Because right now, you don't have, you're not using something else to try to negate the problems. You've been able to drink them away or smoke them away or whatever it is, whatever it is you're using to feel that. You don't, you don't deal with the, issue, with the issues that are in front of you. You just mask that and you keep pushing and keep moving. But when you're trying to live for God, you're forced 
to soberly deal with what's in front of you. You can't run away from it anymore because they, you, you know there's no escaping it. Abraham, as he's getting to this place in his life, uh, Jonathan sang a song a few weeks back about, you know, uh, it's not Isaac that God wanted. You know, it's, it's, it's me that God wants. He said, Abraham, you're going to have to make a decision here. It's going to be Isaac or it's going to be me. When you're living for God, you must understand that the Lord is not asking us to sacrifice our children. He's asking us to sacrifice ourselves. He's not asking us to do things that are unholy, unjust, or unrighteous. He's asking us to do things that are holy, just, and righteous. And that is a sacrifice. Uh, Paul wrote in, the, in Hebrews, I, brethren, I, he said, to present your bodies, uh, present yourself a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, and he called it reasonable service. It's not unreasonable. It is reasonable. It's within our scope, our, our, our grand scope of things, if you will. In the book of James, uh, and if you want to turn over there, you can. I want to read something to you from the book of James in chapter number 1, verse number 12. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love them that love him. Let no man say when he is tempted that I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. Now, all my life I have heard that say that God don't tempt anybody. That's not true. Uh, when you go back and study what it means, what it actually says in the Greek is that God's not going to tempt any man with evil. God's not going to tempt you to do something wrong. Uh, God will always tempt you. He'll always try you to prove you. Jesus asked questions to prove the disciples, to prove what was going on in their mind and their hearts. He, but he was trying to prove it to them, not to everybody else. Jesus wasn't trying to embarrass the disciples. He wasn't trying to embarrass anybody. And God will not try to embarrass you. But God will humiliate you if you're not willing to submit yourself and surrender to his will. So four types of lessons that you learn in Genesis 22. One is a typical lesson. It's a type. The second is a practical lesson. The third is a prophetic lesson. And the fourth is a doctrinal lesson. Uh, you never get through any, any portion of scripture that has any, any good meat in it without getting some good, some good book, some good firm truth. But I want to start with a typical lesson. This event is a type of Christ. You can see Jesus all through the 22nd chapter. And you, can see the, you can see the cross, you see the events uh, leading up to the cross. Uh, it's a type of Christ because, number one, it's got the Father, there's the, the players, it's the Father, and His only Son who was willing to give His life to please the Father. Now, you might say, well, what about Ishmael? Ishmael was born. Well, God didn't recognize Ish Ishmael as a son. That's why we dealt with that last week. Uh, you, so you see the reason God had me do things in a certain order was well, to deal with that and move directly to this. There is a difference in what God recognized. Uh, God, never, God never honored that, and he never ordered that. He never commissioned that, and he didn't bless that. Isaac was the son of promise. So you see the son, the promised son, who was showing up here willing to give his life. Isaac and Jesus, both promised sons, both born miraculously. Sarah and Abraham passed the time of their lives, their natural time, where she should have been able to conceive, where he could have even fathered a child, uh, yet God blessed and a miracle happened and the promised son was born. Jesus, born of the Virgin Mary, sinless, uh, both Isaac and Jesus in type brought joy to the hearts of the father, of their, of their father, and both were born at a set time. Christ was uh, obviously born of the Virgin and Isaac also born of a, of a woman who was without child. She was not a virgin, but she was beyond her time. So in a type, she should not have been able to have 
children, both persecuted by their brethren, and both were obedient unto the death. Jesus was crucified between two thieves, and Isaac went toward his crucifixion with two other people, with two other young men. Uh, those two men had to stay. Only, only the son could go the furthest. Isaac questioned his father. Where's the lamb? Jesus also questioned his father. Matthew 27, 46. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Where is the lamb? Ain't it funny that even in, these, even in the text, there's no way to manipulate it, to twist it. It's the same no matter where you look at it or read it. When Abraham said, my son, in verse number eight, God will provide himself a lamb. I don't know if you're catching that. God will provide himself a lamb. Now we know in the story what did God provide as an offering? A ram. This gets right. This is going to be a good segue to the next point. But God said, but Abraham said, God will provide Himself a lamb. Now you understand a little bit more why the New Testament says that Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, because Abraham knew that even if he had to lay Isaac down, even if he had to run that dagger off in there, even if he had to sacrifice him, God had promised him that child, and God could raise him back up and would raise him back up because he believed God's promise above the circumstance that he's seen laid out in front of him. That's a lesson for you and I, and that no matter what we go through, to hang on to what God has told you and promised you because if you'll do, if you just continue working in the, in the area and toward the goal that God has given you and shown you, you keep doing that, and God will, God will honor that and bless that. Uh, if you stray from the command of God and the will of God, you're going to find yourself in a heap of trouble. Things are not going to go the way that you want them to go. Uh, of course, we know that Christ actually died while Isaac was spared, but in God's sight, Isaac had died. Hebrews 11 and 19, symbolically, Isaac was raised from the dead because God chose a different route. So that's your type lesson. The practical lesson is that, number one, faith is always tested. Let me say that differently. True faith is always tested. Uh, people will come to me periodically and they say, Brother James, I want to do this or I want to do that. And I'll, if you've ever been in those conversations with me, I have said these words to you. Are you sure? Because, you know, once we, once we green light it, there's the, you know, the, we can't turn back. The worst thing you can do is start something and stop. Uh, it's okay to, to sometimes to figure out new ways. You know, sometimes you, you, know, you have to start things, you're kind of feeling it out, and you may have to, you know, make uh, adjustments, and you, know, you may have to punt, play defense for a minute, but you don't, you don't want to quit. You don't want to get out of the game once you start. So true faith is going to always be tested. There's going to always be obstacles. There's obstacles to everything. Uh, one thing the Lord reminded me of this week while I was going through this and, and studying this was all the, all the obstacles that I had here, things that we had that were going in our favor, but at the same time, it seemed like every time I turned around, there was some negative Nancy popping up somewhere. You know, that, I don't know if you know this or not, but the world is full of spiritual Karens. If your name's Karen, I apologize. But the world is full of them. Nobody wants to see anybody. And, you know, I guess the other day somebody might have mis misunderstood my one of the posts I made about, you know, it's okay for people to disagree with other folk. It's okay for you not to agree with me, and it's okay if I don't agree with you on every little jot and tittle. But for me to go out of my way, to try to, to harm you, to hurt you, or to bring you low, uh, that not only is that disrespectful and, and could be viewed or, you know, you could see that as a personal shot, it, it, it's not for me. There's no reason, if you're out there working for the cause of Christ, for me to try to stop you. 
And where I, the reason that I'm like it is I'm reminded in the, in, the, in the New Testament where the disciples are walking along and they told the Lord, they said, you know, there's some folks over here on this other, over here on, on the other end over here that are baptizing people in your name. But they weren't part of our crowd. They're not part of us. So we, we went over there and told them they had to quit. We forbid them. And Jesus looked at them in the face and said, do not forbid them. Because if they're not against me, that means they're for me. Leave them alone. That's why I don't make a habit out of picking on other, other denominations, other faith groups. If, if people love Christ and they're trying to serve Christ and they're worshiping the Lord, leave them alone. I'm not an idiot. I understand that I can't reach every single... It's, it's not for me to reach every group of people. There are people out there that Craig can reach that I can't reach, that Chris can reach that I, can re that I can't, that Brandon or, or Sherry or, or Zach or even my wife can reach that I can't reach. There's always... Everybody in this room has a realm of influence. And there are people in your circle that are right around you that you come in contact with every single day that you have influence over. You can reach those people where I can't reach them. You, you, can, you can say you know them. You're personally acquainted with them. You know what they like, what they don't like. You know how they can be approached and how you can talk to them. And most of the time when people come to church and I have the privilege of bowing in an altar with them and leading them to Christ, Listen, that's not something that, that I take lightly. And I do and I do those things, and I'm glad to do it. But understand this. That doesn't happen without a certain amount of groundwork being laid. People have, people have went in here, and they've paved the road, and they've made it very easy. So by the time these folks get to the altar, they're already, they're ready. They're primed. They're ready. I mean, if some of them will just look at me and, and, and they look at me like, can we just skip on over to the praying part? And I'm, I mean, I, forget all, I understand what all that says. What I'm trying to do, and the whole reason that I keep talking about it and spitting it out and preaching about it and bringing it up over and over and over again, what I'm trying to do, I would love to get to the place where we give an invitation and somebody grabs you by the arm and say, let's go. And you come down to the altar and you say, Brother James, this is... This sister so and so, or this brother so and so here, uh, you know, they don't need to get saved. I led them to the Lord Tuesday night uh, over here, or Friday night over here at this place, and they just want to come and, and tell the church, and, and they want to follow in believers' baptism. I mean, th that's the way this ought to be getting done. And it's not that I'm against doing it, I'm all for doing it. I mean, that's why we do what we do, and I'll continue to do it to the very best of my ability. But I would love for the church to get to the place that we're out here biblically living out our faith. True faith will always be tested. If you think that Satan don't know that the fastest way to stop the growth of the church is to stop God's people from sharing their faith, then you're fooling yourself. The first thing that Satan's going to do is get in front of you and give you every single reason why you can't go tell somebody else about Jesus. He's going to tell you every single reason and he's going to bring up everything from your past, every problem you've had. If you have a squabble with your spouse on the way to church, you, you're going to sit over there and just pout, you know. I mean, I don't understand why we do things the way we do, knowing what we know and knowing who we know. But we know that faith is always going to be tested. God did not want Isaac's life. He wanted Abraham's heart. God's not trying to take your life. He's trying to gain your heart. And sometimes in our lives, we get to places where we don't understand what God is asking from us. But what God is actually asking from us is for him, is for us to trust him enough to lay our future down, to just lay it out in his hands and let him have it. And let him lead and let him guide. And we don't get to know where we're going. We just have to follow for the ride, just go along for the ride. God is wanting our obedience. He's wanting our trust. He's wanting our hope. He already has our future. Isaac was dear to Abraham, and so God had to make sure that Isaac was not an idol. I don't know if you know this or not, but, you know, the day I, I, I was already thinking about this part, the day Jonathan sang that song, When I Lay My Isaac Down. In that second, he said, uh, uh, 
how did that verse go, Jonathan, that last verse? Start it out for me, because I know the gist of it, but I can't remember the words. Uh, and most of us, now most of us, I dare to say, have got an Isaac that's standing in God's way. It's not because Isaac wanted to be in the way of God. It's that God knew if he didn't do this right here and right now, that Abraham was going to allow Isaac to be in God's way. And the only way to make sure that Abraham never forgot not to make an idol out of Isaac was to put Isaac on the altar. Sometimes our blessings will turn out to be curses. Not because they're in and of themselves a curse. It's because we allow them to become a curse. Because we don't put things in proper perspective. For me, I, I mean, Brother Chris and, and Brother Craig, we, we've, been, we've been pretty close. We've been on this since the very beginning. The wheels have been spinning and turning. Some of y'all have come in and, and you, you're getting closer to me and you're hearing me talk and you're hearing the things that, have, that went on in the past and they're still going on now. And I'm going to say this just as nicely as I know how to say it. If I'm not careful, the church will be an idol for me. If I'm not careful, this building will become an idol. And if we're not careful, that building will become an idol. We don't need to lose sight of what we exist for and who we exist for and why he allows us to exist and the purpose that we have. So how did Abraham get through the test? Well, there's a few things right here. He rested on the promises of God. Hebrews 11, 17, 18, 19. God had promised Abraham many descendants, and this promise could not be fulfilled unless Isaac lived. Or God raised him from the dead, one of the two. Abraham understood that. Abraham knew that God could not lie. And we know that God cannot lie. Why do we question him? Why don't we trust him? God, uh, Wiersbe said this, and I, I wrote it down, and I, I told this to Chris earlier. Never doubt in the dark what God has told you in the light. When you get, when you get along with God and God whisper something into your heart it sounds like the thunder from heaven <laughs> you know it's that powerful you know it's God you know God is made it's not a promise for everybody it's a promise that God is making to you individually and when God tells you something in the wide open don't doubt him when times get hard don't doubt it in the dark don't when the storms blow in don't doubt the promise of God you know uh Austin sent me something a while back or a few weeks back about you know when Jesus you know, he, when he told the disciples to go over to the other side, and he saw them out there, he knew the storm was on them, and he, he knew that they, that he had told them to go get in the boat and go to the other side. He did not tell them that it was going to be stormy. He did not tell them that it was going, the waves was going to be white camping. He did not tell them that they weren't going to have to row and, and toil and really work to get to the other side. He just said get in the boat and go to the other side. And when he finally got out on the water, he goes through the water, and in, in one place, the Bible said that he, he went as though, he made as though he would have passed on by. He wanted to go on by. Because in his mind, the last thing he said was get in the boat and go to the other side. But when they saw him, they went to hollering for him. And Peter jumps up, we want to give him a lot of credit. Oh, Lord, if it's you, call me out. Bid me to come. So what did Jesus do? Help yourself. Get on out here. And out he went. You know what happened? Nothing changed outside of the boat that wasn't already wrong inside of the boat. He looked around. He saw the wind. He, saw, he felt the wind. He saw the waves, the lightning. The th he heard everything, the rain, everything beating him in the face. And he looked around. He saw all of those same circumstances and the same problem that he had previously, he had right then in that moment. The only difference was he was looking at Jesus and he failed him. And let me say this to you. If you're not going to believe what Jesus, if you're not going to just trust him without failing him, it doesn't matter if he's standing right in front of you, you're still going to fail him. It's what's in here that God needs to be secured. It's what's in here that he needs to be made strong. It's your resolve, it's your fortitude, it's your character, and he's got, you've got to go through some things for God to make you strong in the area where it counts. And that's that part of you that says, no matter what, I will not quit. You might knock me down. The devil may push me flat on my back. He may put his foot.
foot on my neck and try to hold me down, but I will not lay down. You can't keep me down forever. I will get back up. I will be back in the fight. I will come back. And when I come back, I'm coming back with my father on my side. I don't know how everybody else handles it, but I can tell you this. Trust God's word anytime, every time, all the time, because he's on time. If God said it, that settles it. And there ain't nothing else to say about it. Not, not all of my thinking will never undo what he said. So first, he rested on the promises of God. And secondly, he obeyed God without delay. He never said, hold on. Abraham never said, well, give me some time. He didn't say, give me five minutes. He didn't do like Leonard Skinner and say, give me three steps and try to get away. God, he said, let's do it. And this is something the Lord gave me years ago. I was preaching in this text, and I, I thought it was great about ob obedience. If we do the one thing God tells us to do, God will reveal the next step when the time comes. Do the one thing that God has told you to do. Preacher, I, 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 I struggle. Well, I struggle too. And here's... here's you, you ladies are going through, through Job, and you're going to find this out if you ain't already got there about Job. When Job got to his darkest place, he rose up one night and said, you know what, even if he kills me, I'm still going to trust him. The one thing God has told you to do is trust him. Even if he takes your life, you've got to trust him. Three Hebrew children, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, what did they tell the king? You know, we respect you, but we don't worship you. And even if God allows us to be thrown into the fire, even if we die, we're not going to worship you. We only worship him. When Daniel got put in the lion's den, it's because he said, I ain't going to stop praying. I don't, I don't honor your, your verdicts. You don't tell me I, that I can't pray. You don't tell me that I can't worship. You don't tell me what I can and can't do. God told me to do it, and I'm going to do it. God told me to trust him, so I'm going to trust him. And when he gets there in the lion's den, guess what? The mouths of the lions were closed. Daniel didn't get eat. Lord to God. I mean, I don't know how else to explain it. If you can't do anything but the one thing God told you to do, do that. Preacher, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to say. I don't either sometimes. Trust him. If you don't know what to say, just be quiet, but trust him. If you don't know what to do, then don't do anything except trust him. And if, and if God has told you to do something and you want to be obedient, but you're scared to death, go and do it anyway. It's called trusting him. Believe that he will do what he said he'll do when he said he'll do it. And God said he would do it. His answers never arrive a minute late. They're always on time. Here's the problem. is It's never on my time. And it's never on your time. We always think God's late because he didn't do it when we wanted it done. The reality is when God does it, he does it forever. So when God does it, it's right. And it's right on time, which is, means it's exactly when it was supposed to happen. God supplied the ram. I heard a preacher preach a message one time on the ram. While, the, while Isaac and Abraham was coming up one side, the ram was coming up the other side. So, so right on time... They look over and the ram's caught in a thicket. Caught a goat by the horns. Amen. This is why Abraham called the name of the place Jehovah Jireh, which means the Lord will see to it. Now, here's the thing. This, this, this segues into the next part, which is the prophetic part. And this is what's great. How many of y'all know where this took place at? Verse 2. Took place on, in Moriah. In Genesis 19, a lot would have had to cross Moriah. Here's the thing about Moriah. It's got a name. The actual Hebrew name is not Moriah. It's just how we say it in English. The name of this mountain was Seen of Yah, or God. Seen of Yah. 
which means, and it has a past tense, present tense, and future tense. It, it's really a first, second, and third person kind of kind of tone here. Where it, it doesn't just mean God sees what's currently going on. It's that God has also seen what has previously gone on. And God has also seen what is going to go on. Because God exists outside of time, space, and matter, God's not confined to time, space, and matter. So he's the God inside of time, space, and matter. And he's the God outside of time, space, and matter because he is time, space, and matter. And when he says there'll be no more time, space, or matter, there'll be no more. It'll all be over with. Eternity begins. I don't know about you guys. It's amazing to me that this event takes place on a place where God has seen. And the name of the place that Abraham gives it means the Lord will see to it. So let me say this. If God sees you up to a point, God's going to see you past the point. And God's going to see you see to you while you're in that place. He's not going to bring you to it and leave you there and abandon you. If he brings, as the old saying says, me and Greg said it last night, if God brings you to it, he's going to bring you through it. He will bring you through it. That's why we got to trust him. Moriah is the place, 2 Chronicles chapter number 3, verse number 1, Moriah would become the place. And that's why I say it's past, present, and future. Because in 2 Chron- or 3 Chronicles chapter, one, or chapter number 3, verse number 1, Moriah is the place that the temple would eventually be built. The place where God met with Abraham and Isaac here would be the place where God would meet with his people later on. When the, where the temple was built, where the Holy of Holies would be. Isaac had asked, where is the lamb? But God had supplied a ram. The answer to his question came in John 1 and 29 when John said, Behold, the Lamb of God, pointing at the Lord, which takes away the sins of the world. Amen, buddy. Abraham said, In the mount of the Lord it shall be seen. In verse 14. Christ was seen in the temple and then slain on Mount Calvary. John 8, 56. And lastly is the doctrinal lesson. James chapter number 2. You want to flip back over there? I hate to keep taking you over there to that, but it's, it's pretty good stuff. James chapter number 2 and, and go down to verse number 14. What doth it profit, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith and have not works, can faith save him? If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be you warmed and filled, notwithstanding you give them not those things which are needful to the body, what doth it profit? Even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead being alone. Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works, shew me thy faith without thy works, and I will shew thee my faith by my works. Thou believest that there is one God, thou dost well the devils, also believe and tremble. You say, what's James trying to say? James is discussing the relationship between faith and works. You cannot be saved by works. You need to understand this real clear. Your works are as filthy rags in the sight of God. You can't do good enough to be saved. you, You can't on your own just... Light out doing good. You can give all your money. You can feed the poor. You can help the needy and, and shelter the homeless and, and take care of the widows and, and, and be at every church service and you can throw up hands and worship the Lord. But, it, but I'm telling you, your works don't do the trick. If you don't have faith, you've missed the whole thing. Now, if you reverse that, if you have faith, works will follow. Why is that? Because good faith, true faith, produces works. Does that mean you're going to be perfect every time? No. Are you going to make mistakes? Yes. Are you going to make lots of mistakes? Absolutely. Probably going to make more than you wish you did. Probably going to do a whole lot worse uh, than you ever wanted to do. The reality is, and and I go back to this, I say it a lot, the Christian life will never be marked by perfection. You can't be perfect on your own in and of yourself. You'll never be perfect. The Christian life will be marked by effort. When you do mess up, you own that. 
and you move and you move on. Now I have heard tales of somebody in this room that the homeless people run from them every time they see them come. I ain't gonna name no names, but I heard that there's somebody in the room that loves to buy food and buy supplies and will go chasing the homeless down the streets of Chattanooga. I'm scared to get out over there on that side of town. I'll just be honest with you. I don't even like going to visit people in the hospital over there. I'm scared I'm going to get shanked before I get in the building. Yet this, in, this person is out in the, middle of, in the middle of downtown. Let me love you. Come let me love you for Jesus' sake. All right. Now that's funny. We, we think, but, but let me say this. Ain't that exactly what James just said? What good does it do somebody if we got if we got a, if you've got enough if you've been blessed enough and somebody walks up and they're hungry and you got money and you can help them and you choose not to help them if somebody's starving to death and you got food that you probably ain't gonna eat for six weeks stowed up in your cupboard and you say man I'm, I'm praying for you good luck we're praying for you are you really showing the love of Jesus? Are you really showing people your faith? Or would you be better off to give until to give something you didn't even have? You know, and you gotta trust God to provide to make up what you just gave away. You know, you gotta choose between light bill money or feeding somebody that's hungry. You gotta choose between paying the insurance and somebody that you care about or somebody you just met that's their little kids are starving and you you got means to meet those needs and choose not to to do what god has told you to do, then who are you who are we if we can and i'm and i say this a lot i know i do y'all get tired of hearing it i'm sure but i'm gonna keep saying it till it's stuck in your mind till it becomes your answer without even thinking about it we can't do everything but we can do something we might not can meet every need, but we can meet one need. And I go right back to what I said just a minute ago. If you can't do but one thing, do one thing. If you do one thing, I believe God will provide you with enough, enough resources to do another thing and another thing. True faith is always proved by acts of obedience. Note the accurate translation in James 2.21. Was not Abraham our father justified by works in that he offered up his son uh, upon the altar? Abraham was not saved when he offered Isaac. I've, I've heard people say that before. He was not saved when he offered Isaac. Abraham was, I believe, was, trans, was uh, converted in, in Genesis 15 and 6, years before when he believed the promise of God. When God said it and he took him at his word, that was his moment of faith. This was an act of faith. He was, he was not just believing his word. He was acting on the command that God gave him. He was being obedient to the word. But in Genesis 15 and 6, he trusted his word. By faith are you saved. I, I, or by grace are you saved through faith. It is the gift of God. One of the things that I, I think is important to say, and I'm going to say this and then I'm going to close, but James does not say that, or he, he's not trying to imply that we're saved by works. And he's not trying to imply that we're saved by sacrifices. But what he's saying is the proof of saving faith is an obedient life. If we're really going to be who we are, we, if we're really going to be who we claim to be, then we've got to do what he tells us to do. And, and if you think about it, if you're saved, if God's been good to you, do you really need a reason to love him? Do you really need a reason to show somebody the kindness of God for Jesus' sake? Do you, really, do you really need a reason other than he saved you and kept you from hell? You, you're, you get to be released from the penalty of sin and death and being in the condemnation and the penalty of, of his law. You don't have to go to hell. Do you need another reason to worship him? I don't need another reason, and I hope you don't either. I hope you don't either. Uh, let me pray right fast.
And then, well, I'll open it up for questions, okay? Lord, thank you for this opportunity. Thank you for this time. And Lord, I pray that you just bless and touch in a mighty and powerful way. Thank you for this time to stand one more time. Thank you for all these that are gathered in this place. God, thank you for all that you're doing, all that you're doing, and all that you're going to do. Go with us now. Uh, lead us, guide us, direct us in everything. We'll give you the honor, praise, and glory for it all. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.